When I first started property investing, I had no idea what I was doing. So I would spend days trying to decide if I should invest in a property or not. And I lost loads of deals due to analysis paralysis. But when I started taking property seriously, I was forced to build a system to help me run the numbers and assess a deal really quickly. So in this video, I'm going to explain the two minute deal analysis that I've evolved over more than a decade and which my team and I use on all our property deals. So when you're considering a potential investment, the first thing you're probably going to look at is the price. Now, if someone offered you a one bed apartment in Blackpool for 10 million pounds, you'd probably burst out laughing. Clearly it's not worth 10 million and it may not be worth 100,000. But what about when it's less obvious? Because the first thing you need to figure out before you invest in any property is what it's actually worth. And you can do this by following the same process the professional valuers use, comparing your target property to those that are nearby, similar, and have sold recently. It might feel like there should be a formula or an exact science to this, but no. Using comparables, as they're known, is the way everyone does it. So to do this, go on to Right Move and find sold house prices in the top menu, then enter the postcode of the property you're looking at and set the search radius to a quarter of a mile. In an ideal world, a bunch of properties would pop up that have been sold within the last few years with photos and floor plans that are similar in size, type and condition to your property. You'll see the price that they sold for and if they are truly similar, then you should see that they've sold in a fairly tight price range. So you can use this to get a strong idea of your property's value. But as you may have noticed, we don't live in an ideal world. It's quite possible that nothing will come up or that the sales will be at least a couple of years old which does still make them of some use as a point of comparison, but not perfect. If that's the case, open up your search area to half a mile, but keep in mind that further away means it's less directly comparable. You may also need to consider older sales, but adjust them for any changes in the market since. For example, if prices in the local area have increased by 10% over the last two years, you could apply a similar adjustment to older sales. You'll also sometimes come up against a lack of photos and floor plans, and sometimes it doesn't even tell you how many bedrooms the property has. So take all this as one data point and then add a second. What's up to sale right now? To find this, just go to the regular for sale section of Rightmove and set up your filters to see everything that's currently on the market, including those that are currently under offer. Of course, you have no idea if the asking prices are realistic, which is why sold prices are better, but this still helps you build up a picture. Our secret weapon at this stage is a browser extension. There's one called Property Log and another called Property Tracker that do pretty much the same thing, which is to show you any previous changes in price. So if you're seeing lots of listings that have been up for months and have had multiple price reductions, you'll sense that the market is slow and there's a good chance that the current asking prices won't be achieved. This is, as I said, an art, not a science. And the more you do it, the quicker and more accurate you'll get. Okay, so once you've figured out what it's worth, you'll know whether you're getting ripped off or not. But a fair price isn't the only thing that makes a good deal. A friend of mine bought a house a while back at a great price with a plan to live there, even though he knew he'd need to move after a year, figuring that he could just rent it out afterwards. Well, he could, but he made the mistake of adding up his mortgage and other costs and setting the rent at a level that gave him a profit on top. As it turned out, rents in that area were nowhere near that amount. So he was forced to cut his price or have it sitting empty. And he's been losing a couple of hundred pounds per month ever since. So the next thing you need to think about before investing in a property is how much it will rent for. This involves nothing more than looking at current asking rents, like we did with prices just before because there's no good public database of what properties have actually rented for in the past. So back to right move, go into the rental section, put in your postcode and set up your filters, making sure you've also ticked the box to include let agreed properties. Estimating rents is easier because similar properties tend to be in a tight price band. But again, you have no idea whether these prices will be achieved. However, you can get a clue by looking at how many let agreed properties there are compared to those that are still available. If tons have been marked let agreed and hardly any are still available, that's a clue that demand is strong and the market is moving quickly, which is good news in itself and also means it's likely that renters are having to pay the asking rent because there's lots of competition. Conversely, if there seems to be plenty available and very little let, maybe tenants will have the upper hand and will be negotiating discounts. Again, this is an art and you'll never come to a right answer. So to be safe, you can take a relatively low rent estimate 
so you're more likely to be pleasantly surprised when you come to rent it out for real. So once you've worked out how much the property is worth and how much you can rent it for, it's time to move on to step number three. This is where you can pop your estimated purchase price and rental amount into our spreadsheet, which you can download for free using the link in the description. It'll calculate the stamp duty for you and you can add in an estimate of your purchase costs, running costs and other assumptions. Everyone's assumptions are going to be different. For example, if you're self-managing the property and finding your own tenants, your management percentage will be zero. These assumptions are only ever a best guess, but the main thing is to keep them consistent across properties unless there's a good reason to change them because then you're comparing like with like. On the right hand side, you'll see your key metrics, cash flow, gross yield, net yield, and ROI. The number you should care about most is your ROI. This is the amount of money you make each year divided by the amount of money you personally put in, so excluding any mortgage. You can compare this number to the returns from other properties and even other types of investment entirely. A few very important warnings here. First, this only covers the rental side, which is critical, but is not the whole story of the investment. We'll come to that in a minute. Second, this doesn't take tax into account. Tax applies at a portfolio rather than an individual property level and depends on a million different personal factors. So you'll need to take personal advice to see how this might affect you. And third, this spreadsheet doesn't capture every last cost. I've seen some people build their own versions that are way more detailed. For me though, this is enough. My assumptions are bound to be wrong anyway. And what I'm trying to establish is the big picture. This isn't an exercise in forecasting. It's assessing whether an investment at its heart works for you. Now that you have a clear idea of the numbers, you need to think about the bigger picture. For example, say your spreadsheet is showing you a negative ROI, meaning that you'd be losing money on the property each month. Clearly, this is not a deal you want to go ahead with. You can look at your assumptions and question them, of course, but don't get tempted into fudging the numbers to talk yourself into the deal. You can, of course, change the purchase price to see how that affects your figures, and determine your maximum bid that way if you think it's worth making a cheeky offer. But remember, I said earlier that income is only part of the picture. Let me tell you a story to explain why. A few years ago, I had it in my head that I was only interested in buying properties that would give me a rental ROI of 7%. An opportunity came up, and after plugging in the numbers, it only gave me a return of 5%. So, of course, I turned it down. But what I hadn't factored in was the capital growth potential of this property. It was stunning and in a prime location, just the type that flies up in value when the market's doing well. Lo and behold, when I look at the value of that property through my fingers now, just a few years later, it's worth 25% more than I could have bought it for, which equates to tens of thousands of pounds. If I'd bought it, would I be cursing the fact that I was making hundred pounds or so less per month than my arbitrary target? I don't think so. You never know what future growth will be but you can see the effect it has by flipping over to the growth tab of the spreadsheet. It shows at the top where the property's value would end up assuming a different amount of price growth each year. And you can also see further down how this affects your equity and your ROI. As you can see, just assuming 3% annualized growth is enough to take a property with a rental ROI of 2.3% and turn it into a double digit total annual return after adding on the capital growth. This is why considering your objectives is so important. If my objective had been to generate as much rental income as possible at all costs because I wanted to quit my job, then I did the right thing. The hundred pounds per month would have mattered. But if my objective was to generate the largest total return over a period of 10 to 20 years, which in fact it is, then the decision would be completely wrong. This is just one example. Another could be finding a property that you can buy for a substantial discount. Again, you might not be too bothered about a slightly lower rental return if you're nabbing yourself £10,000 in free equity when you buy by driving a hard bargain. Same again if there's the opportunity to refurbish the property and add value. These situations all unlock extra equity that might, depending on your objectives, be more meaningful to you than hitting a certain rental return number. And just before we move on to the next point, if you like the sound of investing, but you don't have the time to analyse deals like this yourself, we can actually do it all for you. There's a link in the description to book a call if that's of interest. So imagine you find a place that passes the first three stages. It's good value for money, you can charge the rent you want, and the numbers line up with your objectives. You should be good to go, right? Well, not quite. There is still one final thing you need to think about. Many years ago, I thought that I'd found myself a bargain, and I pushed through to completion as quickly as I could before the seller changed their mind. 
It was only once I'd got the keys and taken my builder around to take a look at what I thought was some minor cosmetic work that I found the whole of the front of the house was riddled with damp and needed some very, very expensive work. So if an opportunity passes the first filters based on the numbers, the next step is to dig deeper and find out if something is wrong with it. As my example shows, if you think you're getting a huge bargain, there almost certainly is something wrong. If a property is listed for sale at £20,000 less than a whole load of exact comparables, it isn't because you've got a particularly generous seller. It could be that you've got a particularly motivated seller who's in a rush, which can contribute to being more keenly priced. But for any big noticeable differences, there's probably something wrong too. That something could be structural, as it was in my case, or it could be legal. There could be a short lease or a problematic service charge that means you can't get a mortgage or an extension that was built without planning permission. If there is one of these problems or any number of others, it's not necessarily a deal breaker if you can put it right for less than the discount you're getting. But you do need to be aware of it before you commit. But even if you don't have a screaming bargain that's making you suspicious, there will still be something that's not ideal. Maybe the second bedroom's not as big as you'd like it to be. Maybe there's one parking space, not two. Maybe the area it's in is fine, but it would be so much better if it was only a few hundred yards down the road. Again, these are things you should be aware of, so you're going in with eyes open, but shouldn't put you off completely, because there is no such thing as the perfect property deal. I've been doing this for 15 years. Our company has put together thousands and thousands of deals over more than a decade, and I'm still yet to see perfect. We've done a lot of very, very good, a handful of great, and in my own case, I can certainly say there's been a few average in there as well. But this process isn't designed to unearth perfect. It's designed to be that quick first filter. Do the numbers work? Does it meet your objectives? And what's wrong that you should be aware of? When you're starting out, this process might take you hours to get through. Like I said, I've spent days looking into deals in the past. But the more you do it, the quicker you'll get until you can romp through this first filter in just a few minutes. It's like driving a car. At first, it's terrifying because information is just flying at you. You have to think about every single move you make and you just can't respond fast enough. But as you get miles under your belt, parts of the process become automatic. The information is still flying in at the same pace, but you learn to process a lot of it unconsciously and you develop almost a sixth sense for when something's not quite right and you need to be cautious. It's exactly the same thing with looking at property deals. And to help you get to that point faster, we've put together some free tools for you. So check the link in the description to grab our free deal analysis spreadsheet and a checklist that lists out all the steps for assessing property values that I went through earlier in the video. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the big parts of analyzing a property deal is being able to spot a scam when you see one. So check out this video next where I tell you exactly what you should be looking out for.